Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome back to another Sunday Football Predictions episode. I'm going to be going through all of the Sunday football games, breaking them down and previewing them for you. And I'm going to be giving my predictions on who I think is going to win. Now, we have a lot of games to get through, so I'm just going to get right into it. Starting with the Ca- the Dallas Cowboys taking on the Miami Fish Tank at home. May as well get the easiest prediction out of the way first. I already used up all my rage against the Dolphins last week, so if you want to watch me rant about their tank, then you can go watch last week's video. But I'm also not going to waste any time breaking down a game between a team that looks like it would struggle against some Division three college opponents versus a team that actually belongs in the NFL. I mean, yes, I could talk about how great Dak Prescott has been playing through two weeks. I could also talk about how Kellen Moore has just revived that Dallas offense from what it was a year ago. But the bottom line is it just doesn't matter. The the Dolphins are terrible. They're in a, they're an absolute embarrassment, and there is no way that the Cowboys don't win this game. Although before we move on to the next game, it is worth noting that Minka Fitzpatrick has been traded off of the Miami Dolphins roster, which is good for him. He'll be heading to a real team. He's been traded for a first round pick to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, so the Dolphins fire sale of literally any player that can make a worthwhile contribution to their team continues. That's going to bring us to my team, the Bills, taking on the Cincinnati Bungles in their home opener, the Bills home opener, that is. And before I talk about why I think the Bills are going to win this game, and they will win this game, Cincy, sit down. We need to talk. I trusted you last week. I believed in you. I watched you give a Seattle Seahawks team all they could handle at home in the, in the season opener. Not an easy thing to do. The Seattle Seahawks are good at home and they're a tough place to play. I saw that and I thought, hey, maybe this team has a chance. They might not make the playoffs, but they'll be, they'll be competitive. They'll give some, they'll give some teams tough games. They might surprise some people. So I saw that as you were going in, to a winnable game against the San Francisco 49ers who did not look convincing in their week one win over Tampa Bay. And I thought you guys would show a little bit of moxie, show a little bit of character, show a little bit of fight. And I thought you would come out of that game in your home opener with a win. And what did you do? You lost 41 to 17. I went to the mat for you guys. I went to bat for you and I made the case that you could beat the 49ers in week two. And that's how you repay me? Well, okay. See if I pick you again. Don't worry, Bills fans. I I wasn't going to pick the Bengals even if they had won their game last week because, because I will never pick against my Bills. You can quote me on that. Uh, as long as I'm doing predictions on this show, the Bills are going 16-0 and 0 as far as I'm concerned. But in all seriousness, I think this is a g- another game that the Bills should win. I mean, the, the Bengals have a very depleted offensive line right now, and Buffalo's pass rush can devour any subpar pass, defense, pass protection that the Bengals have. And while Andy Dalton hasn't played terribly through two weeks, in fact, he's actually been pretty good. The Bengals have been pretty effective moving the ball through the air through two weeks. He did throw two interceptions last week in the face of a pretty formidable 49ers pass rush, which shows that he can be coaxed into bad decisions if a team can get pressure on them. And I think the Bills will do that. I think they'll get pressure on Andy Dalton. I think he'll make some bad decisions. And I think Buffalo has a secondary that can more than take advantage of that. But I think the Bill, but I think this is a very big game for the Bills, not because they have a chance to go 3 and 0, but because this is a game that they should win. And we've seen in the past Bills teams go into games with momentum against beatable opponents and then they just lay an egg and lose. We saw them do that in Sean McDermott's first year as coach in Cincinnati. The Bills have had a great start to the season. There's no doubt about that, but if they dr- but if they lay another egg like they've done in the past against the- against this Bungles team and then they get killed the next week by New England, then they're 2 and 2 and suddenly the great start that they've been on, this 2 and 0 run they've been on doesn't really matter that much anymore. So, you got to take care of business in your home opener if you're if you're the Buffalo Bills and 
With all that being said, though, Sean McDermott has been fantastic so far this season and really in his career as a head coach for Buffalo and getting this team ready to go and making sure they're well prepared for games. And I don't think this week will be any exception. I think he's going to have this team well prepared as he always does. They'll probably be extra pumped up for their home opener. The Bills Mafia are going to be are going to be in full throat for that game, I'm sure. And I think the Bills ride that energy and they go 3-0. and And that will bring us to a matchup that's going to stress me out a lot less this week. It is the Lions taking on the Eagles. The Lions are a hard team to read through two weeks. On one hand, they lay a fourth quarter egg and blow a lead and tie with the Arizona Cardinals. Then the next week, they come out and beat the Chargers. A game which, honestly, they had no business winning, but the Chargers just could not do anything on offense in that game. Uh, Goal line fumble, uh, two touchdowns called back on penalties. Uh, That game was all but handed to Detroit. I'm still not completely sold on this team. But you look at the Eagles, and they look like they might be dangerously short-staffed coming into this game. Deshaun Jackson left... Uh, the Sunday night game with a groin injury, he did not return. Alshon Jeffrey left with a calf injury, he also did not return. Nelson Aguilar got banged up, but he did come back in the game just in time to cost his team a victory by dropping a sure touchdown pass. Jason Peters, their starting tackle, got banged up on the last drive of the game. And Carson Wentz got banged up too. He cleared concussion protocol. He had to leave the field for a drive to clear concussion protocol, but he also took a shot to the ribs, which he looked like he was feeling pretty heavily throughout most of the game, so he'll be someone to watch if he's 100% for this game. It's been a rough week for the 1-1 in Eagles in their Sunday night loss to the Falcons, but for me, for this team, the key is going to be whether or not Deshaun Jackson is able to play, because he gives this Eagles offense a major deep threat, and without that, this Eagles offense becomes a lot more one-dimensional. That being said, they're in against the Lions offense, who has been wildly inconsistent all season. Uh, They've showed flashes of brilliance, but TJ Hawkinson, after a stellar debut in Week 1, was nowhere to be found for his team in Week 2. Their their defense held the Chargers to only 10 points, which is not nothing, but again, the Chargers really beat themselves in that game. And while the Eagles may be hurting bad on offense right now, I still have difficulty pinning down this Lions team. Like, what is their identity as a football team? I really don't know. I think this is another low-scoring game. I think I'm picking the Eagles to bounce back. I, I don't necessarily want to press the panic button on the Eagles after one loss. And I also know better by now than to overestimate the Lions after one good win and that wasn't even a very convincing win either so I'm just going to pump the brakes here and I'm just going to stay the course and I'm just going to assume that balance will be restored in week three and the Eagles will right their ship and beat a less than convincing Lions team. That brings us to an AFC East showdown between the Jets and the New England Patriots. The Patriots are running the gauntlet of their divisional opponents. They showed up to Miami last week. They have the, they play the Jets this week, and then next week they play the Bills. So they will have played all three of their divisional opponents in consecutive weeks by next week. And uh, the Bills look like they're the last hope in the AFC East to challenge the Patriots in that division because Sam Darnold's going to be out of this game again with Mono. Trevor Simeon went down with an ankle injury against the Browns, and the Jets are scrambling to find a QB to start against the Patriots coming off a short week. If they And if they start Luke Falk against the Patriots, Bill Belichick is just going to laugh in your face as he zero blitzes him into oblivion, just like he did against Josh Rosen when they were up 43 to nothing last week against the Dolphins. <laughs> Next, we have the Indianapolis Colts hosting the Falcons for their home opener. Both of these teams coming off some really uplifting victories. The Colts getting a hard-fought divisional win on the road, and Atlanta also grinds out a win at home against the Eagles that may have very well saved their season. Julio Jones got his mojo back after getting shut down in Week 1 with 5 catches and a hunt for 102 yards and a pair of touchdowns. Calvin Ridley also broke 100 yards receiving on eight grabs and also scored a touchdown. 
Still nothing going on on the ground for this team, though, as their two running backs ran for a combined 54 yards on the on the game. Not great going against a Colts defense that has actually looked pretty vulnerable against the run in two games. If Devontae Freeman was going to have a breakout game for this season, this would be his opportunity because the Colts gave up 123 rushing yards against the Titans. 81 of those were to Derrick Henry. And that's coming off a game where they got absolutely gashed by Austin Eckler. Indy has some holes on defense for sure, and while the Falcons are coming off a very impressive defensive performance, having picked off Carson Wentz three times in that game, Jacoby Brissett, his numbers don't jump out at you from week two, but he did throw three touchdowns and only one pick, so it was a serviceable performance by him. He rarely costs his team games. Like he doesn't, You don't see him making the same kind of mistakes that Jameis Winston or on some occasions Andy Dalton and Cam Newton have made. And I would also expect to see Indianapolis stick to their game plan, which is just hand the ball off to Marlon Mack. He got 20 carries in the last game against the... Did they play against the Titans? I would look for that to happen again in this game. I like that the Colts are at home in this game, and I do admit that I've kind of fallen for the Colts team and their story this season. I find myself rooting for them in spite my in spite of myself. It's just a really great story. I mean, they're trying to overcome Andrew, the Andrew Luck retirement, something that when it happened, everyone thought that they had no chance and that the AFC South was going to be wide open. But a win here against the Falcons would, I think, firmly put them in that mix to win the division and make the playoffs. <sighs> Screw it. I'm picking the Colts. Next is the Raiders visiting the Vikings. Both teams had amazing starts to the season in Week 1, and both teams kind of came back down to earth in Week 2. The Vikings defense that I said looked so dominant uh, in week one against Atlanta got carved up in the first half by Aaron Rodgers, although to their credit, they did get back on their horse and pitch a shutout in the second half to help their team get back in it. But it was not enough to steal the win from Lambeau. The Raiders, on the other hand, got off to a 10-0 lead on the Kansas City Chiefs, only to give up 28 points in the second quarter to Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. That second quarter and the 28 points were all that he would need to secure the win and drop the Raiders to 1-1. One and one. The Raiders are kind of like the Colts. They had a good story overcoming all the douchey antics that Antonio Brown had subjected them to and getting a pretty solid week one win over the Broncos. That was definitely something special. But I think unlike the Colts, that story is going to be pretty short-lived. I don't think you can blame the Raiders for dropping a game to the Chiefs. They're one of the best teams in the league. But I don't think the Vikings are a very good opponent to have to face when you're needing a bounce-back game either. The Vikings do have a really good defense, and I'm still not sold on the offensive talent that the Raiders have. Josh Jacobs has had a good start to the season for the Raiders, but the receiving weapons for this team really aren't there. And that's coupled with a pair of interceptions thrown by Derek Carr, one of which was in the end zone, which I don't think is something that you can chalk up to a talented Chiefs team, mainly because the Chiefs aren't exactly known for having a strong defense. The Raiders are struggling to find answers in their passing game. I think the Vikings are more than well-equipped to handle Josh Jacobs and the limited firepower that this Raiders team has. If Dalvin Cook continues the tear that he's been on, I think this, the Vikings will win this game handily. And I hate to say that because it, was, it all started so promisingly for John Gruden and the Raiders this year. But that brings us to a huge Week 3 matchup between the Baltimore Ravens and the Kansas City Chiefs. Lamar Jackson versus Pat Mahomes. Round two, if you remember, these two teams played each other in week, I want to say 10 of last year. The the Lamar Jackson-led Ravens were able to force the Chiefs into overtime last year, but ultimately were unable to escape Arrowhead with the win. Lamar Jackson is going to go back to Arrowhead to try and exact revenge for last year's game. And the Ravens, off to a 2-0 start. The Cardinals made them sweat a little last week, but as I predicted, they were able to close that game out, unlike the Lions uh, the week before. The Chiefs, on the other hand, have easily beaten both of their opponents, and Patrick Mahomes is every bit as good, if not better, than he was last season. Lamar Jackson, though, also coming into this game completely on fire. I wouldn't be surprised if this is a very high-scoring offensive shootout. 
I do like the Ravens defense better than the Chiefs defense though if I had to narrow if I had to narrow down an advantage I think the Ravens have better talent on defense than the Chiefs do and if it came down to a defensive stop to win this game I have more faith in the Ravens defense to get it than the Chiefs and I think it will come down to a defensive stop in like a 45 to 43 game And I think this is where Lamar Jackson once and for all proves that he can hang with the big boys and he's going to get a statement win over Patrick Mahomes and firmly cement the Ravens as a legitimate Super Bowl contender in the AFC. I'm going out on a limb here, but it definitely feels plausible. I like what the Ravens have on defense. Lamar Jackson has been playing phenomenal, phenomenally so far. I definitely think this offense can go toe-to-toe with Patrick Mahomes. It's all going to be about how that defense p- plays. But I think the Ravens have a better chance to win this game than I think people are willing to give them. And next we have the Broncos taking on the Packers in Lambeau Field. The Packers off to an improbable 2-0 start. Many people, including myself, thought Green Bay was going to have another down year, probably not making the playoffs. But two victories against divisional opponents in the first two games have them firmly back into the conversation for playoffs early in this season. And interestingly enough, it's been off the back of their defense and not Aaron Rodgers carrying this team to a victory. And make no mistake, the defense has won these two games for them. The offense definitely didn't do it against the Bears. And while they had a good first half against the Vikings, the offense just completely went MIA for the Packers in that second half and it was the defense once again who had to step up and secure the win for them. And while the Packers are in a best case scenario right now three weeks into the season the Broncos are in entering desperation mode. This Joe Flacco led offense has looked anemic through two games. Emmanuel Sanders had a good game last week but much like Garner Minshew in Jacksonville they couldn't put points on the board and they lost to the Bears. Afted on that final drive by bad officiating and a terrible roughing the passer call. But when your team's identity for years has been winning games with your strong defense, that's a game that you gotta close out regardless. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, Once you, if when you hold a team to 16 points, you really should be able to win that game. And I think this Packers defense is going to bury this hapless Denver offense and get off to a 3-0 start and continue their hot start to the season. Kicking off the 4 o'clock games, we have the Carolina Packers. Carolina Packers. Kicking off the 4 o'clock games, we have the Carolina Panthers taking on the Arizona Cardinals. The Cardinals, you can call it a moral victory with the way they kept it close against the Ravens. But moral victories don't show up in the win column as Kyler Murray is still looking for his first win as an NFL quarterback. The Panthers heading into Glendale looking to bounce back from a defeat against a Buccaneers team who, in my opinion, had no business beating them last week on Thursday Night Football. And if I'm the Panthers, I couldn't have asked for a better opponent to play when you're looking for a bounce back game. That being said, though, I look at the way the Panthers have played so flat against the Buccaneers on Thursday, coupled with how feisty the Cardinals have looked in their first two games, and I hesitate to call this game a gimme for the Panthers. I said this last week, and I'll say it again. The Panthers are not scaring anybody with their passing attack anymore. This is a very, very, very one-dimensional offense that is predicated entirely on the legs of Christian McCaffrey, and, that, and it also came out this week that Cam Newton has re-aggravated an injury from last year on his ankle. So who knows if he's 100% for this game. Hello darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. I think things are looking up for the Cardinals despite their shaky start to this season. I think they're heading in the right direction, and whereas the Panthers are not heading in the right direction. They're heading in the opposite direction of the Cardinals. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to say Kyler Murray leads this team to their first win of the season and his first win as an NFL quarterback in an upset victory against the Carolina Panthers. Now don't let me down this week, 
Cardinals like the Bungles let me down last week because there will be hell to pay if that happens again. So that's going to bring us next to the Giants visiting the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Tampa Bay Bucks got themselves a pretty big divisional win over the Panthers on Thursday Night Football. And they come back home with a pretty favorable matchup to go 2-1. and one. With Drew Brees looking to miss six weeks on the Saints, that division is wide open right now. And if the Bucks are able to string together a couple wins during this stretch that Brees isn't playing... They could certainly find themselves in the conversation to win the division this year. I don't know if they stay there. I don't think they will win the division, but they'll definitely be up there if they can if they start playing well. That's a pretty big if though at the moment as the Bucks play the Rams in week four, and that is not a favorable matchup, but they have the Giants this week, and the Giants are looking very beatable right now. The New York Giants, who two weeks in a row have been absolutely pushed around by their uh, by their opponents on defense. And the big news coming out of the Meadowlands for the Giants this week is that Eli Manning has finally been sat down in favor of rookie sixth-round draft pick from Duke, Daniel Jones. That's right, Giants fans. You're finally going to get to see what your top 10 draft pick is going to look like on a, in a real NFL game. Which I personally, I, 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 I mean, I don't get it. I don't know what, they're gonna, what they hope to accomplish with this move. I mean, it's not going to make them any better. I mean, you're in a. I mean, your wide receiving core is so depleted. Daniel Jones is going to be throwing to like the number four and number five receivers. And personally, I would have kept Eli in if I were the Giants because I mean, I get that Daniel Jones. Uh, I get Daniel Jones needs to get playing time, but at the same time, you could wait for some of your bigger playmakers on offense to get healthy so he actually has weapons to throw to instead of setting him up to fail with these scrubs that you're currently forced to start on offense at wide receiver. And as talented as Saquon Barkley is, I haven't even talked about him yet, but as talented as he is, I don't think he's good enough yet where he can single-handedly win games for this team. I mean, the Giants game plan this season is going to be all about Saquon Barkley and that makes them very easy to game plan against. And that's why I think the Buccaneers are going to win this game. So next we have the Seattle Seahawks taking on the New Orleans Saints. Saints are in worst case scenario situation right now if they can't find a way to win games until Drew Brees gets back. Then they're in danger of having this season really get away from them. No disrespect to Teddy Bridgewater. I mean, the guy's a good starter, but he did not look all that convincing against the Rams. Granted, it's the Rams, and that's a tough pass rush to have to just get thrown into the fire against when you haven't started a game in about two or three years, I think it is for him. But this is not set up well for the Saints, hoping to get Teddy Bridgewater off on the right foot. Whereas, this is set up beautifully for the Seattle Seahawks to go 3-0 and and put some real pressure on the Rams for that division, which is looking stacked, by the way. I mean... Between the Rams, the Seahawks, and the 49ers, you could be in a position by the end of this week where all three of those teams are 3-0. and But time will tell on that, though, as because I'd like to see the Seahawks beat a team that actually finishes the game with the same quarterback that they started because they could win this game. They're facing a Saints team without Drew Brees. They beat the Steelers last week. Ben Roethlisberger had to, get, had to leave that game. Seattle has really gotten some good breaks to get them off to this 2-0 start, and I think they will win this game and go 3-0. The Seattle defense, I still don't feel, has gotten its legs underneath them. Jadavion Clowney has still been struggling to get his feet underneath him as a Seahawk. They played better against the Steelers, but they did allow Mason Rudolph to throw two touchdowns to get Pittsburgh back into that game. But Russell Wilson continues to look like one of the best passers in the league. Their offense is firing on all cylinders with DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. And the Saints are legitimately struggling on defense through the first two games of the season, and Drew Brees is going to be missing for six weeks of the season. I'd like to see Seattle's defense step up and really dominate an opponent, but Ted Bridgewater is the highest paid backup in the league for a reason and I don't think this Saints team is necessarily going to roll over either but I am legitimately concerned about the Saints defense and and Russell Wilson can still sling it with the best of them I'm giving this one to the Seahawks (laughs) 
That brings us to the Houston Texans and the, uh, I almost said San Diego, the not San Diego Chargers. The Texans coming off an extremely close call against the Jacksonville Jaguars, where they were half a yard away from losing that game on a two-point conversion. The O-line continues to be an absolute liability for Deshaun Watson and this team as he is constantly getting hit and sacked. And the defense for the second week in a row has failed to get a timely stop to close out a game. I mean, that touchdown that they allowed Jacksonville to score in the last minute of the fourth uh, should have tied the game and send that game into overtime, but Doug Marone had to make the had to make the bold decision to go for two, and they were able to get that stop, but still though, that's not what you like to see on defense. The Chargers, on the other hand, coming off a really bad loss to the to the Lions, a game they probably should have won. Austin Eckler came back down to earth a little bit, scoring a touchdown, but also losing a fumble in that game. And the offense just couldn't put points on the board. They lost 13-10. to This is another team that's really hard to read because the first week, they beat the Colts, but they didn't look that great on defense. And I said in the week two preview that I was worried about how their defense looked against the Colts. They're without Derwin James, but their defense did not look convincing at week one. Defense was not the problem in that loss to the Lions. The problem was Phillip Rivers and the Chargers offense could not do anything. They kept shooting themselves in the foot with penalties and turnovers. And that kind of Jekyll and Hyde performance by a team usually makes me skeptical about their chances for the playoffs. But this could be a big game for the Chargers pass rush, who desperately needs one as they have gotten nothing going at the line of scrimmage so far this season. Only one hit on the quarterback last week against the Lions. I mean, come on, you gotta do better than that. This was a team who was considered over the offseason to be a lock for the playoffs, but two weeks in, there are some holes starting to show. That being said, though, I find it hard to pick the Texans in any game with this O-line unless they're playing the Dolphins, especially against a Chargers pass rush that does have some, some talent and some firepower. It'll come down to defense for me. Do the Chargers finally impose their will on a team and, su- and get sustained pressure on a quarterback? If they do, then I think they win handily, and if they don't, then I'm not sure. I want to believe in the Texans. They have so much talent on offense, despite that terrible O-line, that I think they will win, but it'll be another close one. But I'm tentatively giving this one to the Texans. Next is the Steelers taking on the San Francisco 49ers. And if you're a Steelers fan and you're absolutely devastated to the injury of Ben Roethlisberger, look on the bright side. At least you have Minka Fitzpatrick. But the 49ers are coming off a very convincing 41-17 win over the Bungles, which I'm still salty about. But credit where it's due, Jimmy Garoppolo had a much better looking game than he did in Week 1 in Tampa, throwing for nearly 300 yards and 3 touchdowns. The run game was also on fire, gashing the Bungles for a total of 259 yards rushing. The Niners come into their home opener riding pretty high, hosting a Pittsburgh team who could not be riding lower, having lost Ben Roethlisberger for the year. The future is now for Mason Rudolph, and even if Mason Rudolph comes in and he plays great, I mean, losing your starting quarterback for the season is a very heavy blow, and it's usually pretty tough to recover from for teams. But Steel- but like I said, the Steelers' problems haven't just been on offense because their defense hasn't been anything close to what it was expected to be. And again, they traded for Minka Fitzpatrick, so that's that's great, I guess. He'll probably play well for this team. At the end of the day, he's only one player, and this Pittsburgh defense as a unit has greatly struggled so far. And this could easily be another 300-yard game for Jimmy G and another huge game for their running backs. I think the Niners take this. And that brings us to the Sunday night game where the Rams take on the Cleveland Browns. Why is this a primetime game? Like, really, why? Why is it a primetime game? The Rams off to a 2-0 start following a dominant victory over the Saints in the NFC Championship rematch. Obviously, Drew Brees went down early in that game but it was still an impressive game by the Rams. Meanwhile, the Browns, riding an entire offseason of hype, got absolutely slapped around in Week 1, and then just beat up on a Jets team that was forced to play their star- their third-string quarterback for a majority of the game. Yeah, I'm not sold on this Browns team. The talent on offense is undeniable. Baker Mayfield 
is looks like he could be a great quarterback. But this O line, much like the tight, much like the Texans, has been an absolute disaster, and they're heading in to take on an Aaron Donald-led Rams pass rush. This team constantly shoots themselves in the foot with penalties on both sides of the ball. They still look undisciplined, which is a failure of the coach as well as their players. And I am not putting any stock in this defense who just held a third-string Jets quarterback to three points. I don't even need to talk about the Rams because, I mean, you just look at these two teams. You look at Cleveland, you look at the Rams. And who's the better team? It's, it's the Rams. Finally, the Monday night football game sees the Chicago Bears heading into the nation's ta- capital to take on the Washington Redskins. And the Bears finally learned what it's like to have a successful game-winning field goal attempt. But that game did nothing to silence any Mitch Trubisky doubters as he passed for 120 yards and no touchdowns. Oof. Now what you like to see if you're a Bears fan. The bright side is that I don't think this Redskins offense is anything that your defense can't handle. Although they have put up three or more scores against two pretty quality opponents through two weeks. And this Bears offense isn't winning any offensive shootouts anytime soon. So if they can't wrap up Case Keenum in this Redskins offense, then this could get real ugly real quick. Having said that though, I have plenty of confidence in this Bears defense. It's the offense that I'm worried about. And most of the time, good defense is good enough to cancel out a good offense, and it's usually enough to win games. In Super Bowl, let me explain. In Super Bowl history, when the number one offense has taken on the number one defense in the Super Bowl, the number one defense has won all but one of those games. Now, I'm not saying that I think the Redskins are one of the best offenses in the league or that they're going to the Super Bowl, but that statistic is what I'm thinking of when I pick the Bears to win this game. And just like that, we're through another gauntlet of Sunday night, of Sunday afternoon football games. All of the Sunday games, all the way down to the Monday night games, have been talked about, have been previewed, and have been predicted. Let me know down in the comment section who you think is going to win this game. Or who you think are going to win these games. Let me know down in the comment section below. Please like this video and subscribe. That would be very helpful and I would be very appreciative. Uh, And as always, have a blessed week and we will see you in the next video. And as always, go Bills.